Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you here today, and I just want to thank you for praying th- uh, for me a couple of weeks ago. I, uh, I keep having episodes of, of vertigo unexpectedly in, in strange places. I was on travel for work, and that happened to me when I was, uh, I was up in Northern California, and it's uh, uh, <laughs> rather shocking to have something like that and you're so incapacitated, you just can't do anything. And, uh, and uh, it's like the Lord is reminding me when those things happen over and over that I'm not in control of my own life, that he is and I can trust him. And also to give me much compassion for all of you out there who have suffered from that. And so, uh, and so I think that's what's going on and so uh, it's great to be with everyone today, and uh, it's great to be preaching back again from uh, John uh, chapter 8. And uh, greetings to everyone out there who, is, who are live streaming uh, the service this morning. Greetings to you guys, too, as well. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I would hope that uh, you have been learning quite a bit uh, uh, in, as we've been going through this study in the Gospel of, of John. And uh, I certainly have been learning quite a bit as uh, uh, not just from my own studies, but obviously from Pastor Richard and Pastor Greg as we've been trading off, taking portions of scripture and reading them. And I've been uh, experiencing a new understanding and uh, deeper in-depth, uh, in-depth understanding and knowledge of this book. And so, uh, the title, as Pastor Greg just said, is The Truth Will Make You Free. I think we've all heard that used in one way or another. Um, certainly we've read it here in Scripture. And so as we've been studying uh, the Gospel of John for the last several weeks and immersing ourselves in the culture and the occasion of when Christ lived, we have found ourselves almost experiencing this book as one of those gathered in the temple area courtyard during the Feast of Booths, standing there and listening to Jesus preach. And if you were there at the feast, of course, he came in the middle, so you, if you're there listening to him over the last three or four days of the feast, you would have noticed uh, uh, various people's reactions to uh, what he was saying. Maybe you would have your own reaction. Um, And so a lot of those people there gathered around him and listening uh, would have been Pharisees and scribes, some would have been local uh, there, and some would have been traveling there as required for all males uh, to go there um, from all of the region around. And so, uh, but they were all gathered there for that feast, and perhaps... um, uh, you would be surprised, right, at, at so far from what we've read, what some of the reactions were. So in context of what we've been reading and learning, some of the Jews that were listening to Jesus were astonished, were they not, about how he spoke. In fact, it seems like everyone was very astonished by how he spoke and spoke. And when the uh, temple guards came to arrest him and they were sent there to get him and they came back empty-handed, right? And they, uh, well, what happened? Well, you've never heard a guy like him preach uh, before, and, and uh, you should go hear him, perhaps, right? And so um, they said in chapter 7, right, so the feast, context of the feast is mostly chapter 7 and 8. And so you see in chapter 7, uh, we read that um, some of these uh, people gathered there, these Jews, have said, how has this man become uh, learned, having never been um, educated? And that's in uh, 7.15. And some of the Jews listening to him also said, you have a demon. How about that? Uh, so that was in verse 20. And some Jews were confused, I think, and said, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly and they are saying nothing to him. So they're confused that the, the, the rulers uh, there uh, really... Uh, don't know if this is the Christ or not, evidently. Um, And they also say, however, we know where this man is from. 
but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Verses 26 through 27. Uh, but many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? And that's in the end of, uh, or uh, in 731. Still other Jews were confused by his saying, Jesus saying these words, you will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. And uh, some, after hearing him speak, said, certainly, this is certainly the prophet. And others were saying, this is the Christ. And still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? And so uh, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Right? They had all these varied reactions, right? Some for, some against, some confused, uh, and everything else. And, uh, and they didn't know that he was speaking of his father in heaven. And so they said to him, where is your father and who are you? Okay. And so others said, surely he will not kill himself. Will he, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. That's in chapter 8, verse 22. And all of these reactions from the Jews in the previous two chapters brings us to the beginning of the passage today, which starts in verse 31. But before I get there, I want to back up a little bit to verse 30, uh, where despite all the ruckus, confusion, and various reactions from the various groups of Jews gathered there, um, this is what it says. This is what John has recorded for us. And he spoke these things, and many came to believe in him. That's in John 8.30. And so I will come back to that verse, verse 30, here in my ser sermon. But for now, <clears throat> I'll use that as an introduction to today's sermon, which I briefly first want to take a look at verses 31 and 32, and then we'll take a deeper look into them, okay? And so uh, verses 31 and 32 read... So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What great words, right? To those who believe, these are very promising words. And that's John 8, 31 through 32. But I want to stop here, and I just want to make mention, as we look at this familiar phrase, uh, which expresses the main thought of this passage and also my sermon. And the main idea is basically compro composed of two clauses made up of 13 words in the New American Standard Bible. Um, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And I just want to say a little bit about this well-known phrase. And uh, before we really get too much deeper into the text. So this phrase must be one of the most misquoted and used out of context and misused phrases that Jesus ever said. And it was misused by, uh, by the world, right? And so this divine truth spoken by Jesus himself concerning true belief and freedom from the condemnation of being a slave to sin has been downgraded in modern society to just a convenient motto or slogan often used by secular universities and politicians, okay? And so the irony of secular universities and politicians using Jesus' words to serve as a motto for their institution or political cause where the truth is often absent or worse yet rejected should come off as insulting if not outright blasphemous to all of us Christians. And so, believe it or not, uh, this phrase taken from these verses is carved into the wall in the original headquarters building of the CIA. And so, the CIA is basically saying, in essence, it pursues critical information that is truth in the service of liberty. And of course, that ideal has come under much scrutiny in recent years, as we've seen in the news and what is purported about the CIA and all of the corruption that we see coming out. 
and also many buildings on many campuses around, around the country have used Jesus' words and carved them into building blocks of those schools. The uh, uh, University of Austin at Texas, when I was there, I noticed that one time that uh, this is carved in there, but there's no um, citation to where it comes from, right? And so many of these institutions, like institutions, right, they don't quote the sources being from, from Christ at all. It's almost like they want it to be some uh, anonymous uh, sort of phrase that anyone can use any way they want. And it's, uh, it dawned on me that there's probably uh, who knows how many students um, have uh, read those words and actually have no idea where they come from, that they don't even come from the Bible. Um, but anyhow, uh, probably many of them have no clue. So I mentioned the secular world's out of context, <clears throat> excuse me, use of Christ's words in verse 32 to make the point that anything used out of context is what? It's merely a pretext, <clears throat> pretext, right? And I think Tom Carson, uh, who is a writer, ascribed that saying um, uh, to know the truth and the truth will set you free to his father, who was a Canadian minister. But it's a phrase we often hear, the phrase, a text without a context is a pretext, right? And that phrase, a text without a context is a pretext, has been used as a main principle in the study of hermeneutics, which any good expositor of scripture must keep in mind when inter interpreting scripture. So today, as we look at this passage of scripture, I want to demonstrate and explain the tremendous and significant meaning of knowing the truth and that the truth will set you free. Free from what? I think we all know the answer to that, right? Free from sin and uh, being a slave to sin. And it's obvious that many of these institutions I have mentioned have misused this quote to create a righteous appearance, to cloak the real intention or state of affairs, right? And and promote what we would call falsehood. Um, and they uh, reject the truth, actually, and counter the truth. So it's ironic many of these buildings, especially at some of these uh, schools, have this carved into their building. And, of course, the real definition of knowing the truth in the context of verse 32 is to come to know and believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and by believing in him, frees you from the condemnation of your sin. So these institutions have taken the precious and powerful word of God and reduced it to a mere, weak, humanistic, offhand, pretextual phrase. And it's shameful, is it not? And that's what I want to say about that and uh, what I wanted to say, so I said it. And so now we're going to get back to the text, okay? That was just all part of an introduction. So like I previously mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, I wanted to start today in verse 30, which was really the, actually the last verse last week that we ended on that Pastor Greg preached on. Because I want you to understand the context of this next passage today uh, concerning the hearts and the minds of the Jews who were listening to Jesus. And I think it's paramount that you understand where these Jews stood when John says many believed in him, okay? Uh, unless you understand what kind of belief these Jews in verse 30 had, and yes, there's different kinds of belief that the Bible talks about, uh, the rest of this passage won't make any sense to you. So I think it's, it's important that I at least try to explain that because it, it kind of sets up uh, the whole of 31 through 36. And so again in verse 30, uh, John says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So here's what we know about different groups of people in the crowd that came to hear Jesus uh, according to John in his book, right? And so we know that the Pharisees and scribes, first of all, who he was primarily addressing because he was having this conversation uh, with them, he was having a dialogue with them, uh, didn't truly believe in him, 
at all by virtue of, of what they were saying. As Jesus was speaking, they were coming back and basically rejecting everything that Jesus was saying. In fact, if, if, if you want more proof of that, just read to the end of chapter 8, which we'll get to in a couple weeks. What do they want to do with them? Right? They want to stone them. They want to kill them. Of course, he accuses them of that too. So they're rejecting it. After all, right, they accused him of having a demon. Right? So they're rejecting him. Uh, another group or, um, that came to hear him in the crowd were offended by his words about them in relation to their Jewish faith and rejected him. Uh, the most offended being the Pharisees and the scribes, but certainly other devout Jews uh, uh, obviously would be offended by many of the things that he, he said about their alleged faith in Moses, right? And the law of Moses and everything else. And so Jesus had some, he had some hard sayings about that and what they were doing didn't jive what they said they believed in. And also many in the crowd were largely confused by the statements Jesus made and didn't understand what he was saying and no doubt rejected him, right? I mean, Satan, right, clouds people's minds. God is not yet revealed to people. Uh, the disciples uh, also had trouble understanding and Jesus needed to explain the, uh, the uh, uh, things he was saying to them um, often. But nevertheless, verse 30 says that many in the crowd came to believe in him. And so I have the words believe in italics in my notes because we really need to understand what kind of belief these had uh, that are being spoken of here in verse 30, verses 31 through 36. And so first off, this kind of belief we see here spoken of in verse 30 may have been the superficial kind, the kind represented by the parable of the sower um, as the seed that fell on rocky ground where someone who hears the word at once receives it, right? Sometimes with joy, but then they have no root and uh, they last only a short time. Uh, when trouble or persecution comes of the world, they quickly fall away. That's taken from Matthew 13, right? We know, we know that parable. So to help us understand what kind of belief we see here in verse 30, we need to see what kind of belief we have already seen in the book of John by people who have listened to what Jesus is saying. So we saw at the Feast of the Passover in chapter 2, you've got to go back a little bit, and if you remember in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, that many believed in his name. That's what scripture tells us. John testifies now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus knew that those who believed in his name, spoken of here, did not truly believe in him, for he himself knew what was in man. So it's obvious here that those who believed in him uh, had a superficial belief at best. Another example of belief that is not true belief is found in John chapter 6, verse 66, where Jesus spoke at the synagogue in Capernaum. Many that believed in him were also called disciples. And what did they do after Jesus finished preaching there? Well, according to verse 66, John says, as a result of this, his preaching, Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Um, what? His disciples left him? Well, not the original 12, right? And Jesus challenges them. Do you guys want to leave too? Right? And Peter exclaims, well, no, we believe in you, right? You are the Christ, the Son of God, right? But his disciples, uh, those people who had uh, wanted to follow Jesus, at least physically, uh, follow him, maybe not spiritually, and wanted to be kind of a student and listen to what he was saying. Um, and so um, 
from these verses in the context of the book of John, we see that the many who believed in him were not true believers, and many who were his disciples were not true disciples. Of course, Judas wasn't a true believer or a true disciple, was he? And he uh, followed Jesus, uh, at least physically, to the end. So it shouldn't surprise you that the many who believed in verse 30 were false believers. So in John's first epistle, we read what false belief looks like. And so uh, in the back of your Bibles, uh, you'll find the epistles, 1 John, 2 and 3 John. And we read in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. So John, who's writing his gospel, he understands as he writes these epistles what false belief look like. So all these passages point to a superficial belief or a false belief of those mentioned in verse 30. And you have to understand that in context of this passage or the following verses won't make any sense. And so that takes us to the beginning of this week's passage of verses 31 through 36. And so here in verse 31, if you look at that, John says, Jesus was stating to those who had believed in him uh, the following in verses 32 through 36 concerning the test of true belief and true discipleship, right? It's a test of true fellowship, as we might say. So what I did here in this next section of these one and a half verses, that is the second half of verse 31 through verse 32, was to break down these verses into three parts and use three verbs to illustrate what it takes to truly believe in him and be a true disciple. So this is the main point of the passage and of my sermon this morning. And that is, I'll just say it again, uh, this is, I just, it illustrates these verses here, 31 and 32, what it takes to truly believe in him and be a true disciple. And like I said, that's the main point this morning. So I would hope that you would understand these three points of what I'm going to make here of what defines a true believer and a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And these three things are as follows. And if you take home nothing else, hopefully you can take home these three things today. Okay. So uh, the first point, uh, which I'll expound on a little bit later, is continuance in Christ. And that's in the second half of verse 31. We often call that uh, 31b. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It's continuing in Christ. The second point is cognizance of the truth. I was trying to find another word that starts with the letter C. So (laughs) I didn't use knowledge, but that's what it means. And it's the first part of 32. We call it 32a, and you will know the truth. Okay? And the last part is unconstrained by sin. I know I cheated there a little bit and used, uh, had the hyphen un in front of constrained, but unconstrained by sin. In the last part of verse 32, 32b, right, right, we read, and the truth shall make you free, right? You're unconstrained by sin anymore. So starting in verse uh, 31b, um, the first part of what it takes to truly believe in him and be a true disciple is continuing in Christ's word. Okay, so this imperative is found in this verse, the last half of verse 31, which is essentially, in the most basic of terms, continuance or continuing in Christ. So Jesus here isn't telling them how to be a disciple, but how to know you are a disciple, okay? If you are looking for the assurance of salvation and that you have been made and that you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, here it is right? And this is how you know. Are you continuing in Christ? Uh, That's a major point uh, to know if you are truly a disciple. And so true disciples of Jesus Christ will continue or remain in both faith and obedience to his word. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So there is no such thing as a Christian or some mutant form of a Christian sometimes called a carnal Christian, 
uh, I hate that phrase, who has some sort of private faith where they believe uh, but do not obey. They live a carnal life. And there's no such thing. You either believe and obey or you don't believe and you don't obey. Okay? And so the two, belief and obedience, go hand in hand. They have to go hand in hand. Right? The word and the deed go hand in hand. So if you are truly a believing Christian and call yourself a believer, you must also be obedient to Christ and his word. There's no exceptions to that. That should... That should uh, be characteristic of your life, right? It is only then having both belief and obedience in place can you consider yourself to be a true disciple of Christ. Now, I don't want anyone here going home and uh, today to think that just because they have some kind of intellectual assent or head knowledge of God and try to keep his laws in some religious or even pharisaical way, uh, that you would think you are a true disciple of Christ. So you may be a disciple and claim to be a learner or follower of Christ, but so were those in Capernaum, right? They claimed that, but they weren't. And they eventually withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Uh, and that happened when things got tough or when Jesus' words were just too hard to accept, too hard to believe, too hard to obey. They were false disciples, and so if you continue in Christ's word, that is, to know him through his word and to follow him, you will seek to know the truth. And everyone who hears Christ's voice and comes to him is of the truth and is worthy to be called a true disciple. And so we read, or we'll read later, and we'll uh, understand when we get to John 18, which will probably be in a few months, um, look at verses 37 through 38, and that illustrates this point when Jesus was questioned by Pilate, right? Uh, John is recounting that encounter with Pilate, right? And they brought Jesus to Pilate. And it says there, therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And so I would just say you better make certain that you are not just a disciple in the broadest sense, going through some of the motions of being a disciple, because if you are, you will eventually fall away. It's inevitable. You'll eventually fall away if you're just going through the motions. So make your faith certain, okay? Make your faith certain. You've heard that preached from this pulpit many, many times. And so my challenge to you is the same Peter had with the first century church, which he states in 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, which is obedience, you will never stumble. So take a look at your life. Ask yourself if you are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, who continues both in faith and obedience to his word, okay? That's the test. You need to look at yourself. You need to be truthful. Since we're talking about truth, knowing the truth, be truthful with yourself and examine yourself seriously, okay? The second part of what it takes to truly believe in him and be a true disciple is cognizance of the truth. And so we see that in the first part of verse 32, cognizance means knowing or understanding. And so the prerequisite of knowing the truth is found in the previous verse, right? The last half of verse 31, which is continuing in Christ's word. But what is the truth? Pilate had that same question, but was asking it in a general sense as the philosophers of the day define truth basically pretty much as anything uh, anyone decided according to themselves, right? So it was this ambiguous thing, right, that uh, philosophers would wax on about. So Pilate asked, what is truth? But Jesus, in his conversation with Pilate, was speaking of the truth, the definite article, I have come into the world to testify to the truth, John 18, 37, and what is the truth? A better question might be, and uh, you might be thinking this already, who is the truth? 
right? So truth in the context of this verse is not information, right? Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. He permeates creation and all of existence, and truth saturates space and time. Truth is eternal, and Jesus says elsewhere in John 14, 6, concerning truth, I am the way, the, the truth, right, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So scripture is the revelation of, of divine truth, is it not? So Jesus is truth, or we could say that Jesus is truth incarnate. Okay, and those who are true disciples, true believers, know him and he knows them. They have true knowledge of the truth, and that's true. Is it not true? Okay, I don't know how many ways I can use the word truth. And it's not just some head knowledge of the truth, but a personal knowledge of the truth as instilled in us by the Holy Spirit. And if you know the truth, you walk in the truth, if you are walking in the truth, others will see that and recognize that, and what a great witness that is, is it not? Amen? So you need to challenge yourself, okay? Well, not another challenge, yes. You need to challenge yourselves and see if you're walking in the truth. Would others look at your life and say, you are walking in the truth? So let's briefly skip over to the second and third epistles of John, and if you want to turn there, better known as second and third John, um, in the back of your Bibles, right, almost to the end, Jude and Revelation, follow. So this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, I think you know that, where we find ourselves in this study. So this is the same person who's speaking. And uh, in Second John, right at the beginning, uh, starting in verse 1, we read, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. So John here is referencing his knowledge of the truth in several different ways when speaking to the chosen lady, as he has identified in these four short verses. And so in verse 1, he says, he loves the chosen lady in truth and all who know the truth, meaning all those who are in Christ. And so in verse 2, John says he loves all those who are in Christ for the sake of Christ when he says he loves all who know the truth for the sake of the truth. That's essentially what he's saying. He's saying that Christ, who is truth, abides in believers and will be with them forever. And he goes on in verse 3 to state that grace, mercy, and peace comes from God, the Father, in Jesus Christ, in truth. Because he's the author and personification of truth and love. And finally, in verse 4, John said that he was happy to find some of her children walking in the truth. Isn't that great? Uh, which is walking in Christ. So in Third John, okay, if you turn there, John continues the theme of walking in the truth and says to his dear friend um, Gaius in verses 3 and 4, For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your faith. And so, um, and so we see there in verse 3, um, that John adds uh, to the saying, and nothing makes him happier to know that his dear friend Gaius, who eventually, who evidently led to the Lord in the faith and taught to walk in Christ, is still what? Walking in the truth, because he is one, one, one of his children, right? John is saying he's a lot older, so those a lot younger uh, than him, right? He referred to him in that loving way. And so we look at the uh, second half of verse 32. And so the third part of what it takes to truly believe in him and be a true disciple is being unconstrained by sin. And the truth will make you free. Um, Leke Alder, in an article he wrote for the uh, Luminaire Journal, um, said, quote, the statement, and the truth will make you free, implies an imprisoned self. 
right? And that's what the Jews were upset about when Jesus said that to them, were they not? And so uh, the prison is sin, it enslaves. And John says in verse 34, whoever commits and practices sin is the slave to sin. So Jesus came to set us free from bondage of sin. And it's why he died on the cross. Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin miserable life. So we're no longer at sin's every beck and call. Amen? Okay, when Jesus died, he took sin down with him. Unquote. Okay, continuing in Christ's word and being cognizant of that truth, which naturally follows, brings spiritual freedom. Truth isn't some ambiguous idea or set of standards in this context. Not at all, right? And so we can set the cap, who can set the captives free from sin? Who is it that can actually set captives free from sin? And so look at what the prophet says about Christ in Isaiah 61. 1. You don't have to turn there, but this is what it says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim what? To proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. So what is the good news? It's the gospel, right? That's the good news. We know that. Some of you might even have one of those Bibles back from the 70s that says good news on it, right? That is the gospel, right? Is the Bible. So freedom from sin is the good news, which is liberty to captives and freedom to those who are imprisoned. So those who abide in Christ are no longer a prisoner of sin. Those who abide in Christ walk in the truth because they know the truth and are no longer constrained by sin. And so challenge yourself today. This is the third challenge. Are you a captive to sin? Are you a prisoner to sin? If the answer is yes, then you are constrained by sin. Do you want to be free from a life? controlled by sin then if you do believe on the lord jesus christ today right we have to examine ourselves be critical of ourselves john exhorts listeners in first john 1 9 and says if we confess our sins you know the rest of this he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us uh, from all unrighteousness right so confess your sins God is faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you, uh, cleanse you, meaning your soul, from sin. So this is the marvelous feeling of your sin lifted, your shackles broken, and your soul renewed, right? For those of us who've, who've been saved, it's this euphoric feeling. It's really hard to explain that when you accepted Christ, this happened. And so basically any hymn or song that we sing that has the words of how our sin has enslaved us, but Christ has freed us from that sin, always brings a tear to my eye. And so the overwhelming joy of receiving forgiveness from sin, undeservedly from our gracious and merciful Savior, is almost too hard to express in words, right? It's hard to explain that. And, uh, but many a hymn writer and author have done their best to try. And so as I was preparing my sermon, I was thinking of a familiar hymn written by Charles Wesley. He was a hymn writer, a very prolific hymn writer. As you well know, I think most of you who have been around the church for a while have heard of his name. And so, um, and so uh, he has written many, many songs, and many of them you would, that would be familiar to you. And one of them is O oh, Four Thousand Tongues, right? And he, in there, tries to express the unfathomable riches and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and to give him all praise, right, for what he has done for us. And we will only be able to praise and worship him in a perfect sense, however, when we get to heaven. But Charles does a pretty good job with this hymn. Actually, he does an amazing, great job with this hymn uh, as God had, had moved him to write it. And uh, I'm sure this hymn is a, uh, is a favorite of redeemed sinners uh, everywhere and almost at any time. I think it's, it's 
today a great hymn. So if you listen to the lyrics, I'm not going to sing it, don't worry, Uh, especially in verse 4, which is speaking of prisoners set free, I'm sure this will have a great impact on you, as it always has, I think, when you sing it. Because when we pick music, right, our music ministry picks music that has very um, uh, impactful words found in, in God's word itself. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious, I'll just skip the first four because I'm not going to make it. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean. His blood availed for me. John Wesley also wrote, And Can It Be, which also has wonderful words about being loosed from the chains of bondage to sin. And I'll only give you verse 4. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be? that thou, my God, should die for me. And so what great, so rich in truth and theology, these hymns, and I'm sure there's many others that we don't have time to talk about because we're trying to stay within the text here. But what comfort it brings to those who sing these hymns and others like them who have been set free from the bondage of sin. Amen? Amen. And so after Jesus said these words in verse 31 and 32, the Jews Jews who were listening to him must have been shocked to hear that they were not free, but could be free if they would come to the knowledge of the truth. And they answered him and said in verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Their response is a strange one, since, right, everyone knows, right, it's not, uh, it's not a secret, it's not somehow buried in some textbook nobody ever read, it's not a secret that they've been enslaved to, uh, to Egypt from the time of Moses and the Exodus to where they find themselves today, and many nations in between, right, and so they find themselves today under the control of Rome. And so their response uh, must have been a reference to the fact that they had religious freedom, is what they were talking about, even under the, another na- nation's control. So their response to Jesus reflects that they were confident in their religious pedigree as Abraham's descendants and that they were religiously or spiritually free. But they once again didn't understand what Jesus was talking about and what he was referring to. And so Jesus explains in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And the idea communicated in the original Greek in this verse for the word commits means that the person has a lifestyle or a character of continually giving oneself over to something. So this word does not refer to individual acts of sin when it says commit sin, but refers to a lifetime characterized by and devoted to continual sin. And the point here is that those Jews who responded to him in unbelief in verse 33, right, that's the crowd he's speaking to, were the same Jews in verse 31 who he was speaking to who were the same Jews in verse 30 who came to believe in him 
the judgment levels on them here is that they were still enslaved to sin, to sin despite some kind of level of belief that they might have had. Furthermore, by stating that they were enslaved to sin meant that they had no relationship with God and therefore had no relationship with Jesus. As such, they couldn't continue in Christ because they never were in Christ. They never were in Christ because they didn't believe in him as the Christ, the Son of God, and therefore couldn't be his true disciples. And if they weren't his true disciples, they obviously couldn't know the truth and therefore couldn't be set free from their sin. It's kind of a run, a run on syllogism. <laughs> uh, if they couldn't be set free from their sins, they would eventually die in their sins, right? What's the result of that? And, um, and he had just spoken moments before in chapter 8, verses 21 and 24, that these Jews who had been rejecting his message all along were going to die in their sins. When he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. And in verse 24, Jesus says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The consequences of rejecting Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God, is that you will die in your sins. So some may be thinking, what a horrible thing to hear, right? You're hearing Jesus, well, I thought Jesus was just preaching love and, and life and goodness and everything else. Well, like I said, you may be thinking, what a horrible thing to hear, not only for the Jews, and maybe you might be thinking for us today, that if you don't believe in him, that you will die in your sins. And you may be asking yourself the question, is Jesus telling the Jews and me today that I am going to die in my sins. Well, let me tell you, that's not the most horrible thing to hear. It's the most compassionate, actually, and most loving thing anyone could ever hear if you are not a believer. Not if you are a believer, but if you're not a believer. So that you will know that you will die in your sins unless you accept Christ and walk in him. Okay, so are you going to respond to the gospel and get on your knees and repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness? Or are you going to die in your sins? Okay, so listen. Hell is a reality. It's not some figure of speech we often hear to describe some terrible earthly event or negative personal um, experience. Maybe we don't preach on hell enough, but... We're here in John, right? And we shouldn't be afraid to preach on hell, should we? We want to preach the full counsel of God. Jesus wasn't afraid to preach, to preach on hell. Uh, he has given ample warning to those who reject him of the misery of hell. In fact, Jesus spoke more on hell than anyone else in the Bible. I think you know that. This is why Jesus said, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Dying in your sins implies you have no fear of God. Jesus referred to hell as a place of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, he calls it the hell of fire. He also calls it eternal punishment. All those things combined indicate hell will be a solitary place of eternal darkness and never-ending punishment and a never-ending fire bringing about a never-ending cycle of sorrow and pain. I don't need to repeat that. I think you got it the first time. Believers will have, right? We will have a glorified, regenerated body when we die, free of sin and pain and experiencing nothing but joy. Unbelievers, on the other hand, will have cursed bodies, regenerated in a way to continually suffer punishment in hell. This is what awaits those who die in their sins. Right? God is a loving God, but he's also a just God, and he has just wrath. And so they will die in their sins, a continuous destruction of not only their bodies, but their souls. It's a heavy thing to think about, right? Continual destruction of your body and your soul. Fear him who can destroy both soul and 
body in hell. Okay? And so the end of this passage we are looking at today ends in verse 35 and 36, where Jesus says in 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. This was a final warning to the Jews who rejected him. Jesus used another analogy of slavery here, uh, as opposed to the, the first analogy in the beginning of this passage, to illustrate that the son has permanent rights in the household and the slave has none. The son remains in the house forever and the slave does not. That's obvious. So MacArthur, in his commentary on these two verses, states that in Matthew 8, 11 through 12, which I quoted some of it already, the Lord, the Lord warned, I say to you, that many will come from the east and west and, re and reclined at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so here today, it is only uh, those who receive Jesus Christ as son of God, whether descended from Abraham or not, who are truly sons of God. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Unquote. So Jesus says in verse 36, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. He was merely reiterating the reality of verse 32, which was the truth will make you free. The truth, as we have learned, is none other than Jesus Christ himself, the personification of the gospel. Essentially, Jesus is saying that only he can that is the son, lowercase s in the illustration in verse 35, and the son, uppercase s in the verse 36, can make you free, free from slavery to sin. And only when you are free from sin are you free indeed. Amen? So Paul, in closing, in Galatians 5.1, gives an appropriate benediction to today's sermon on the freedom from sin and says this, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And that again is Galatians 5.1. And that is our charge today. That's the charge that we go home with. Those of us who believe um, today is that we need to stand firm and not be subject to the yoke of slavery to sin. For those who do not believe, I think I've given you plenty of challenges, plenty of points to examine yourself and examine your life and examine if you are walking in the truth and if the truth has set you free or not. Because if you're not walking in the truth that hasn't set you free, you're still a slave to sin. Are you not? But the good news is you don't have to be. You don't have to remain a slave to sin. Christ can set you free. So repent and believe in him as your Lord and Savior today. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this, these verses, Lord, and, uh, and we just thank you that your son um, spoke these things and that we thank you that by providence as your divine uh, will has preserved them as uh, the Apostle John has written them down for us here, Lord, and that we would pray that whether we are saved or unsaved today as we're looking at these passages, Lord, or just pray um, in its own way, that we know that it would have an impact, and we know your word does its work in people's hearts, and it does the work even in our hearts and causes us to grow, those who believe, and, but that those who don't believe, it convicts, Lord, and we know that uh, for those, we would just pray that it would convict them of their lifestyle of sin and that they aren't free. Um, they are not free at all. And so we would just pray that these words from your word would find their place in people's hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.